We're going to proceed with the next portion of our program, which is um, the awarding of the uh, Fred W. Stewart Medal and, and our award lecture with uh, Linda Farrell. Um, we're very pleased to have with us today. Um, as you probably know, the uh, Stewart Award awardees are nominated by the faculty and voted upon um, as someone who has made a lifetime of contributions to the study of um, pathology and, and, and cancer and, and human disease. So um, I'm going to introduce now Jin Rushia again, who will introduce Dr. Farrell. Thank you, David. It really is my great pleasure and truly, truly a distinct honor to introduce our Steward Award recipient, Dr. Linda Farrell. Now I'd like to start with this slide. I only have one slide. And actually I'd like to start with this book. So, you know, we all have a lot of books on our, text, on, on, on our shelves, but to me, few books match the, the depth and comprehensiveness of this liver pathology book. And I think all of us liver pathology lovers would agree that this is really one of the great resources. And for many topics, I personally think this is the absolute best. <laughs> so for this, we have Dr. Farrell to thank. Anyway, Dr. Farrell obtained her MD degree and received her pathology residency training from the University of Kansas, followed by fellowship training at UCSF. She then joined the faculty at UCSF and remained on faculty there until 2015 when she retired to, retired to emeritus status. So over the years, Dr. Farrell has served in multiple important roles at the UCSF, including distinguished professor in anatomic pathology, endowed chair, vice chair of clinical affairs in the Department of Anatomic Pathology, director of surgical pathology, director of surgical pathology fellowship, director of GI liver pathology fellowship, and so on. Now at the national, international level, Dr. Farrell has also played important roles. And she, just to name a few, she is a, a past president of the Hans Popper Hepatopathology Society, and she's also a past president of, our, of the US CAP. And so Dr. Farrell has really devoted her academic career to the study of uh, uh, liver pathology and her contribution in the field of liver pathology uh, really is too much, too numerous for us to go through in detail here. More than 200 publications, numerous book chapters, major liver pathology textbooks, generations of trainees, and numerous awards. Now the specific fields that Dr. Farrell has particularly left her mark uh, on um, are particularly about fatty liver diseases and also well-differentiated liver tumors and nodular lesions. And I believe Dr. Farrell's talk will be touching on those important topics. So we really look forward to that. So just to sum up, I think, um, Dr. Farrell's career achievements really uh, served to exemplify how we, how dedicated pathologists can make deep impact in the field of medicine. And very importantly, uh, Dr. Farrell's achievements really served to carry on this steward spirit to keep advancing our field, to maintain the very important role that we pathologists play in medicine and oncology. And so we congratulate Dr. Farrell on this very well-deserved steward award. Honor. Oh, I forgot to flip the slide. There was a, supposed to be, so then nobody sees the medal, you know, so. Oh, yeah. There it is. Well, hers has her name on it, and everybody's seen that picture of Fred, but uh, it's uh, iconic, so very good. All right. And I think he's going to put my talk up here. But I want to thank again for, I thank everyone here for uh, 
um, bringing me here for this lectureship. And uh, and I have to, and uh, he said when he told us uh, that we could uh, speak about anything, I thought, oh, okay, all right, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm not going to, but he's balanced the program very well. I told him I was going to kind of focus on what's hot in liver pathology these days or what I kind of see as our evolving, uh, uh, evolving problems. So, uh, and of course, through the years, there's been a lot of changes in liver pathology, I think. Uh, and so this is sort of one of my views on uh, two topics that I think in particular has really grown in interest and, and, uh, I have to go back a few years when I was young. Do I look a little different, I guess, you know? The early 80s when, you know, I went to UCSF, and, and that's actually Ronald Reagan was the president, and Joe Montana was really the thing in San Francisco. So, uh, but, uh, of course, when I was young, too, in those areas, well, fatty liver was due to alcohol. And then if you were, if you had fatty liver, you were lying if you said you didn't uh, drink. And then, of course, uh, pedicellular adenoma was really rare and was called hepatic adenoma. And, of course, there was a few other things going on at the time, such as uh, hepatitis C wasn't even identified and was known as non-A, non-B hepatitis, for some of you who can recall that era. Transplant liver pathology didn't even exist essentially, you know, it came like another 10 years later, really, we got into that. And HIV AIDS, in fact, well, the first day I popped in the cutting room in charge of the cutting room as the chief resident and surgical pathology fellowship, uh, uh, fellow person, the one fellow, where I was, uh, that this was, uh, walked in our uh, cutting room, essentially, and so it was an evolving epidemic and really consumed all our attention. Uh, for many years there, as we know, on coast to coast, as we did here. But I'm going to, uh, uh, but those entities are uh, gone. Uh, you know, HCV is going to now be probably out of the picture. HBV is gone out of the picture, pretty much so with the treatment. And so I'm going to focus on stuff that has really become uh, uh, kind of the next wave, which is the fatty liver and the adenomas, which are kind of a change. So. Let's take a look on how that happened. If we move on to the mid-90s, you can see my hair is a little shorter. It's easier as you get older, I think, you know, to do. But I want you to look at that computer. Can you remember how they were these little boxes with the dark screen and green and white printing? And, and even the look at where you put your disk in. You know, you have to find where you put your disc in there, and, uh, and that's what we had. All those slide flats, slide flats still are the same. See, you know, slide flats on my desk. So, so anyway, so that's, uh, that's how things change there. Uh, but uh, when I was, about that time, though, was when we realized there was another epidemic emerging uh, that affected liver uh, pathology, and this was the obesity and metabolic syndrome epidemic and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And so it no longer was just due to alcohol. And in fact, that's when the CDC started tracking uh, obesity. And you can see we're a pretty blue country back in that time, according to their data in 1996. But it was becoming uh, uh, different colors. Uh, notice Colorado likes to brag how they've stayed a little less. And we'll see that here in 2006. Now the incidence is um, greater than 25% in many parts of the country. And, and then as we move on, CDC did change the colors. I think they decided to leave the blue-red phenomena behind and go instead with other colors. But we can still see that there is uh, still uh, more states now, greater than 35% of the population even uh, checks in as um, greater uh, than 35%. Uh, uh, so we are in an issue where even as early as uh, early 2000s, The Economist was recognizing this was going to be a problem. And But even so, you know, uh, even a couple years ago, I read a, uh, uh, an article in the Scientific American, that really nice journal that's sort of readable for all of us who, you know, like science, et cetera. And they had an article on, uh, on uh, uh, obesity. Liver was not mentioned anywhere in the article as an area of concern. And yet, uh, of course, in my world, this is all about obesity and, and, and my metabolic syndrome. And so I think it's underlooked sometimes. It's overlooked uh, as a part of the major spectrum of disease that goes with this uh, 
with this issue, and it has complications associated with it too. So in that, with that in mind, I thought maybe we would uh, uh, start out with a little overview of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and what lesions there are. Plus, uh, you will see this, even though you're a cancer center, you some, you, at least some of you see uh, samples from the liver, and what's going on in the background uh, is uh, something that you will have to deal with. And now that you know that uh, there's so many people out there with fatty liver, uh, what is, we'll review some of this first and how we've come to uh, uh, classify and recognize this. And, and I got involved early with the NASH CRN as it uh, got going, uh, the ne clinical research network for uh, was established by NIDDK and the uh, NIH. And we came up at that time with some of these three major areas of concern. Of course, is it just fatty liver without risk uh, or steatosis uh, without risk for NASH? Is it NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, where you have, not, you have also cell damage, inflammation, and risk for fibrosis? And then, of course, the end-stage cirrhosis. And I put that a little separate because some of the histology actually can uh, have a significant different pattern. And of course, the natural history has long been, uh, you know, um, at least speculated and now coming a little clearer that, uh, that you have some people who probably never develop a steatohepatitis or fibrosis, some that develop a uh, NASH, and some that go on to uh, uh, cirrhosis. And uh, there have been very few longitudinal studies done prior to the establishment of this uh, clinical research ne network. And so that's what they've been doing all these years. And they're still in operation, although I'm not longer involved with the group. And my clinical colleague, uh, Ryan Gill, has taken my place on the panel. But, uh, but basically, they're they would still come to the, the extraordinary conclusion that the oversupply of fatty acids in combination with the defects in metabolism of these patients um, contribute to that. Of course, we could have, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to pinpoint any single one problem with this, of course. It's really a big multitude of issues. Of course, the usual associated risk, as you know, are obesity, diabetes, type 2, hyperlipidemia, and that then, of course, defines sort of that triad that's typical of the metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. And the typical histology we look for are the large and small droplet fat. Uh, the NIDDK uh, and NASH-CRN have tried to discourage the, the uh, use of macrovesicular and microvesicular as terminology because it's... Uh, has been a little misused in the literature. It's, the criteria wasn't ever really set. So they tried to make a break from that, just kind of avoid some of the confusion. And, and uh, I'll show you what, how we define that. You have, uh, but you also, you would expect some degree of inflammatory infiltrate out in the lobule or in some of the scar tissue that develops in some of these uh, um, cases. Uh, balloon hepatocytes, we'll define that. And then we, but, and then there's typically a central zonal predominance for the fat, the ballooning, and the scarring, as you all know. So here's sort of your classic picture on liver biopsy, where we have the uh, um, central vein here. We have some um, swollen or ballooned hepatocytes that we can see here, quite large. And then we have the small droplet fat, which are these fat droplets here that less than half the size of the uh, hepatocyte. And then we have the large droplet fat, which essentially um, uh, takes uh, over the entire cell and uh, usually pushes the nucleus aside. So we kind of split it along that line. But the classic central zonal pattern here. And then as you develop the fibrosis, this typically occurs first in the central zonal areas. We can see in these sections from um, the same case, and you get this, often get this wrapping around this pericellular pattern of fibrosis in these instances in these zones. I find that for early fibrosis, the trichrome is often very helpful because the pink can kind of just disappear in the background of all these pink hepatocytes, uh, et cetera, too. But what is a ballooned hepatocyte? I was um, amazed at myself when I first got together with the NID uh, DDK NASH CRN group. That's what people were calling ballooned hepatocytes. You know, I guess they're swollen, uh, but uh, you know, it's uh, 
you know, what's the perfect balloon to pad a site is still maybe a, a little bit of a point of contention uh, internationally. But uh, basically, it's going to be swollen, larger than the average uh, pad a site. You'll see focally condensed cytoplasmic contents, maybe some little fat in it, although it's, it's often they don't have a big fat droplet. That's not the typical cell. It's really more of a swollen cell due to other edema, maybe some smaller fat. Uh, fat droplets. And it may or may not have Mallory hyaline. It's not required to have uh, Mallory hyaline within the cell to call it a ballooned uh, patocytes. And, of, and uh, importantly for the um, uh, NASH CRN was that ballooned cell numbers were used to grade the activity as a marker of cell damage. And so uh, and that was, and those classical balloon cells again is here we see uh, uh, what has been the defining uh, the definition as enlarged, made greater than 1.5x. This got more refined over time, and so I've obtained this uh, slide uh, with my colleague Ryan Gill, uh, to, um, uh, who um, gave me this information here, what they're working on. And they, you want to see that cytoplasmic clearing, cytoplasmic clumping, and may have Mallory uh, dink bodies. Non-classical ballooning, though, is now another term that they're looking at. After about 10 years of looking at all of these balloon cells, they decided we're seeing a lot of cells that don't quite meet the classification standards. But maybe these also are significant as sign of injury. So they came up with the terminology, and this was after I left the group, of non-classical ballooning, typically in zone three again, and perivenular. Smaller than the classical balloon cell, but uh, might even be about the si same size as the, apata uh, the adjacent hepatocytes, but may have the same cytoplasmic alteration, slight condensation of the cytoplasm, but no uh, Mallory involved. So here on this side, we see your classical balloon cells with uh, some with some well-defined ropey Mallory. Here's a very nice large one with a couple nuclei. That condensation, not so well-defined for the Mallory. Again, very well. Here on this one, we'll see cell that's not as big and uh, has some condensation. Both of these do. These would be considered uh, non-classical. Well, this one over here, classical. They've also developed more recently a proposed uh, a modified score for the balloon cells, not uh, modifying what was originally this NAS scoring or the scale of one, two, three for none or a few or many. And, it, and they added in this new um, uh, concept of the non-classical uh, cell, uh, balloon cells. So the old ballooning scores, say if there was a, you know, it was more based on on whether you had just classic balloon cells, but now you can, you add in, you, they've expanded the number up to four to include when you only see the non-classical. So these are then things that would come into the uh, uh, idea that these are still maybe a significant issue if you can't find a definite uh, ballooned hepatocyte. And this still remains unpublished. It takes a while to get through all the powers that be, I guess, at the NIH, but they're working on it. So, but he was, gave me permission to bring this to you as, as something to, uh, that they're working through and if already proven uh, statistically uh, that works out that this is pro uh, predictive of uh, activity. So based on their analysis, what they've done so far, where they look at this, they, they actually think that adding this extra point of this possible balloon cell or non-classical balloon cell doubles their ability to give more weight to uh, cell damage as a predictor of activity and potential uh, damage due to steatohepatitis. And it does show excellent correlation with the clinical features as well as associated risk factors for having these, having steatohepatitis. So, of course, everything they're trying to do basically with fatty liver disease, disease is determining then what are the keys to progression of NASH. We, we know that the activity relates to it, but also the activity related to uh, fibrosis. That's the key. Do, do they get fibrotic? And again, as time has gone on, because now they've been looking at this for over 15 years, that um, uh, 
they uh, do see that, uh, that histological features can correlate um, with the improvement or regression of fibrosis. So in other words, if you come in with your follow-up biopsy and you have less activity and less balloon cells, that seems to correlate with the fact that your fibrosis may not have progressed or you may have even regressed and vice versa. If your activity remains the same or you have a worsening of the activity, then your fibrosis is more likely to have expanded as well, which it all makes sense, but it does seem to be uh, to correlate uh, over that. Now, there's uh, other findings in the process that they have, uh, with, we have, uh, have noted are, could be kind of surrogate markers of what's going on in this process. And one is apoptosis. You see this is uh, in the background of these uh, steatohepatitis, those isolated uh, apoptotic cells. And that seems to correlate uh, in a similar manner to the balloon cells when you see them. So, uh, uh, of course, that, that apoptosis is often, again, more, a little more prevalent uh, associated with uh, fatty cells or, uh, as well. And then another, other features that we have noticed as well, that just in the process of the fibrosing uh, aspect of NASH, was that they're increased in some of the microvessels, so you're getting kind of reactive a vascular reaction, uh, kind of a, a transformation of some of the sinusoidal endothelial cells to a more CD34 uh, type, and increased number of small arteries in these uh, scars and in the central zonal fibros uh, fibrosing zones. And uh, it's, it gets more, more prevalent as you go through later stage disease. And uh, the problem here is that, um, and the reason this has come to light is because basically it gives you an issue that if you're looking at a biopsy and you see an artery in a fibrotic area uh, in a liver that uh, you, and uh, you might think it's a ductopenic portal tract. And then you may um, have a little issue about what's really going on with it. I think that's when I first noticed it myself was on a uh, biopsy in a patient who had obvious alcoholic liver disease, because it was there too, on a biopsy. But, you know, I, I just happened, to, I comment says, well, you know, she's 40. I don't know if she's trying to get BBZ, but they, PBC, but they were going to transplant her anyway. But once I got the big explanted liver out, I thought it was very clear. Well, those are central zones. There's balloon cells around there. You know, I think I was my first year on faculty. And so I kind of just put it aside as something everybody sees and who knows until I showed a case at one of my liver group meetings with the elves and half of the group claimed, no, you're showing a portal tract. The other half says, no, you're showing a central zone. And, and then, uh, of course, now they all believe me because they started looking for the arteries in the central zones and you can have this, I guess, what's ingrowth in there. In fact, here's an example of what we've seen here is uh, this is the central vein. You can see the balloon hepatocytes out behind here, the fat, and a couple branches of arteries in here, but there's no duct. But yet this patient didn't have, uh, didn't have uh, any, uh, cholest um, any copper or anything around here to suggest that's real cholestatic effect. And there's also the kind of dilated sinusoids of poor blood flow that you might see around there. Here's one that's more obvious. It kind of, you can see the central vein right in the center and the artery sitting right here. It's not actually kind of in the center. You can see it's right next to a patocyte, so the location often doesn't really correlate as nicely as you would expect a normal portal tract to have with its nice intact triad. And of course, you see the, the, balloon, the ballooning around here and the uh, pericellular fibrosis. All right, so what about other findings that you see in later stages of fibrosis? Well, interesting enough, the balloon hepatocytes tend to want to shift location from the central zone. Perhaps, as you know, they're re-arterialized and the vascularity changes, that the physiology also changes as to where the fat is stored and where the ballooning occurs. 
So you tend to see the balloon hepatocytes just along the septa, often along the peri more periportal septa at the periphery of the nodule and the cirrhosis. And they can be very scant in number. And in addition, the fat can often decrease in amount. So there is probably, again, some physiologic thing going on where the liver is now no longer storing the fat. And the um, degree of lymph uh, lymphocytic infiltration, particularly in the portal zones, which can throw people. And of course, in uh, the era of HCV, that was always the issue, is this patient also have hepatitis C. But that goes increases, can increase. So what you end up with is a cirrhotic liver with more lymphocytic inflammation, particularly in the portal zones or in the scar zones, and uh, hardly any fat or no fat. And the really only thing you can say about it is, oh, well, there's a balloon hepatocyte over here along some of the septa. That may be your only clue that this is uh, related to uh, end-stage steatohepatitis. Uh, that, uh, that may be, and we've now, the NASH CRN has actually seen that sort of spectrum of change, so I think it's a pretty good link. So you're, these, of course, in the past have been called a cryptogenic cirrhosis, but I think there's good clinical evidence even some years ago, that there was a tight correlation with these so-called cryptogenic cirrhosis with diabetes and uh, marked obesity as far as the incidence of those things occurring uh, together. So it all kind of makes sense now that we've seen this follow that line. And of course, no entity is complete, we all know that, unless it has its variants. And we do have our variant of steatohepatitis oils, particularly in the pediatric population, which unfortunately we're seeing an increased incidence of steato uh, fatty liver disease there with similar risk factors. And children can get the same pattern as adults, but that there is an increased pattern where you have, uh, you don't have that zone three prevalence of injury of either fat or fibrosis, as the fibrosis can begin more in a periportal manner in these patients. And you may not see the balloon hepatocytes. You may have severe fat, um, no balloon hepatocytes, and uh, yet periportal fibrosis. And this was initially uh, kind of coined as type two NASH by the San Diego group who saw a lot of uh, um, Hispanic patients in their population, which tended to be the ones who had this uh, pattern, as well as the more prevalent Asian and Native American ethnicity. And then uh, these were, again, they found it was much commoner, and the NASH CRN has uh, also validated this. In, it's commoner in the younger patients, boys more than uh, girls. Another variant more recently been pointed out in the literature is one uh, I've rarely seen as the uh, aggressive form of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And this is uh, one that's uh, typically would think that's associated with very rapid weight loss and or malnutrition. Um, and, that, uh, and in those cases, it looks more like alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis in that you see a lot more of this extensive intralobular fibrosis, um, extensive central zonal injury, or even sclerosis, where the vessel itself looks more damaged. Um, and you can, uh, um, but you can see there's a lot more. It not, doesn't look as distinctly nodular. It looks much more fibrotic and, uh, and rapidly progressing on with this. And yet, it doesn't, in this, uh, showing the orsine stain here, that you're developing this fibrosis rapidly enough that you don't have extensive elastosis like in the typical established, long-established cirrhosis that has very good elastic banding as part of the cirrhotic process. So this uh, you can maybe occur over a matter of six to uh, nine months or so. And so it's quite a much more rapid process. There are still some arter arteries here that have ingrown here as well, even though in this uh, particular uh, aggressive case. So what about NASH in the future? Well, obviously liver disease complications have been relatively under-recognized by the public, as by, at least by my experience with Scientific American. And there's uh, much we still don't know about the pathogenesis, although there can be, there's a lot of factors probably involved. But still, in fact, in, in spite of all the study that's gone into it, it seems like the best thing we can do is to remove the risk factors. 
to, uh, to help uh, the lesion regress. And the sooner you get to trying to remove those factors before an established fibrosis occurs, the better things are. And of course, if you can remove some of the fat and get rid of that factor as well, you may also reduce their risk, as you heard this morning, for pedicellular carcinoma, but also for the other entity that comes as part of this phenomenon is the re-emerging hepatocellular adenoma problem, you know, from, uh, and uh, so uh, these have been an unexpected sequelae of this as well, and it's kind of rejuvenated a lot of my interest in, well, I don't even say rejuvenate, it's got me more interested in molecular, I don't think I was, well, all that juvenated uh, before, so. But I now, you know, uh, quite interested in some of this. So my part of when I was young, part two, goes to deal with hepatic adenomas because uh, they were really rare there then. And typically, the old version is of this, as uh, some of us knew it, was it was a rare woman, a rare lesion in young women with the history of oral contraceptives. And, you know, for really going back in the past, that was when they had the high dose pill. And that was associated with these kind of hyperplastic like lesions that would regress uh, when you took them off the pill. And this thought the risk of HCC was very rare. In fact, I look back at a case I published, one of the first ones, and I kind of wonder if it was something, some other than the pill related adenoma, because it it was so, those were really probably more hyperplastic or not quite as uh, interesting. And maybe I was really into a not otherwise specified adenoma. I know it wasn't fatty, so it wasn't one of those. But again, it was thought that they, they did have the risk of the hemorrhagic complications, but they had the bland cytology. And we see here the reticulins are intact and pretty much the plate architecture is got that kind of interanastomosing cell plate, very typical of the liver. And I want you to kind of note that because there are some subtle differences now in the current types of adenomas we see and how the pattern looks. That can be a key even if you're not using the new stains that we have. But HCC, HCAs, in my opinion, aren't rare anymore, particularly if you're at one of these centers where you see tumors. And uh, there have been, uh, um, Professor Paul at the Bulak Saj was one of the uh, a major uh, p uh, persons in the world. I call her the queen of adenomas because she really got this interest going and, it's, uh, and started the publications of these different uh, uh, variants of adenoma. And uh, basically these four major types are still um, what's uh, since year 2000 or so have been, uh, are, are still are good for putting out what type of major variants we're seeing. We have, the, we have these four here, the HNF1 inactivated, uh, HCAs, which are the fatty ones typically, the beta catenin mutated ones, which of course are the biggest concern for the risk of HCC, or are they really just lesions transitioning to that? We have the inflammatory type adenoma, and this is the one that's really been uh, a bugaboo since the obesity epidemic has uh, started. And then we have what's left over, and we'll have a new information about one of the new leftovers for you but the, when we, as part of this presentation. So first of all, let's talk though with the HNF1, and this is the hepatocyte nuclear factor inactivated one, and uh, this is the one that characteristically has this small, just almost large droplet fat as a very characteristic feature of the lesion. There are a few rare ones where the fat isn't as prominent, but for the most part, if you see something that looks diffusely fatty, you'd be starting to think of this lesion, and they typically have a, a reticulum pattern that looks packeted, at least in much of the lesion. If you look at this in the background liver, again, here's your background, so you see your, your plates lined up as they are in kind of this anastomoting pattern, and notice how these want to do little clusters or rosettes uh, for the most part. But yet the reticulin isn't really prominent, but it's, it's, uh, it's not lost, of course, but it does want to packet it a little more, and that's a very typical little, what we call a little small acid or a packeting pattern. And, uh, 
And of course, you know, you can see some of these type of things in tumor and cancers too, but this is a, a very common, a routinely kind of uniform throughout. It's uh, with a little patchy uh, variation with this uh, more uh, anastomosing pattern. Now, this lesion can be multifocal in these patients too, so you might see other foci away from one lesion of little fat and you just these little flat, fat globules. They'll again show maybe early change in the reticulum pattern there. And uh, characteristically, they lose this uh, liver fatty acid binding protein. And that uh, is uh, lost. So you can pick out even the micro lesions if you do a stain on that. And uh, um, of course, all liver cells will produce that uh, liver fatty acid binding protein. And so when it's negative, that's very uh, helpful if you're considering this is essentially diagnostic then of this type of adenoma as long as your cytology reticulin pattern fits with this. I want to point out too, look how the background liver cells kind of get trapped as the lesion's growing. So there's really no capsule, it's just kind of pushing, you know, kind of gradually expanding into the um, background. So what about this variant? Well, they're about 10% where there's a familial mutation, and I think it must be something French because they have all kinds of these, you know, something from France. So if you have a French name, you know, your background's French, you might be more apt to get this because Paulette has the most cases I've ever seen of this particular variant. But um, and so rarely can be in men. But otherwise, it tends to be associated with the maturity onset diabetes of the young, type 3. They can get the adenomatosis. And even in retrospect, a lot of us in liver would look back and say, perhaps what has, in some cases, was called that focal fatty change. I don't know if some of you remember that. It's, Probably some of those could have been these adenomas. Yeah, so, uh, and, and then there's, but there's still a very low risk for HCC in this type of lesion. And in fact, just recently, Awan Putra um, uh, put forward an article that's going to be now in Press and Modern Past, you all get to read it, about how there probably are rare cases of this lesion progressing, but it took us quite a while to to identify those takes takes a little bit to come up with that. But on the other hand, you still can't use this um, marker as a marker for hepatocellular adenoma because you can, some HCCs that aren't related to this adenoma at all also lose um, the, the liver fatty acid binding protein. So it's, again, just it's only helpful as a definitive marker if your rest of your lesion fits with a benign lesion. All right, so we go on then to our next big category, which are the beta catenin mutated lesions. And typically, these are the rare, they are rare solitary lesions. So they aren't associated really with adenomatosis. They have a high risk of HCC transformation. And of course, they're the ones also that are associated with the male hormone and male gender. So perhaps those old steroid, steroid lesions that uh, um, the um, USC group uh, originally described, Bob Peters and that group uh, years ago, probably were dealing with some of these that looked like they were transitioning and it was, that's why it's so controversial, were these benign or mal malignant? And of course they have the link to the uh, gene you've heard a little bit about today in HCC, the CTNNB1 or beta catenin gene. And uh, Paulette of course has again been very instrumental in defining, better defining these beta catenin lesions. So we can identify these histologically with two markers. The beta catenin stain should stain, uh, may stain the nuclei in such lesions as a, a dark uh, stain. This type of stain isn't good enough. You have to have it nice and dark for it to be real just to make sure you have it. But unfortunately, this can be absent in many of the cases. They can be kind of rare events, and especially if you have a, a biopsy. So the surrogate marker has become the glutamine synthetase as a down step uh, enzyme that can be upregulated with this mutation. And a typically diffuse strong staining is the highlight for lesions that may have this um, defect. So 
The, um, now there is, of course, this high risk for HCC, and it had been noted even in the early papers that this was the one adenoma that seemed to be more associated with cytologic atypia, uh, some pseudoglandular change, and some focal loss of reticulin. So here you have a part of the lesion that looks a little compressed and maybe not quite as in atypical cells and a little more of a plate pattern intact and then gets a little more atypical here and then a little more intact plate pattern. And you look at the reticulin and some of these more solid-like areas start to have fragmentation of the reticulin and uh, loss of that. And that's, of course, we know now that these are probably the ones that are uh, to be called at least atypical and maybe, uh, of course, transitioning to HCC, if not already, past that uh, mark. So uh, that, of course, was the question now for a long while. Are these really very well differentiated adenoma-like HCCs? And there have been some variety of studies that have kind of suggested this. One so of my colleagues was one of the, um, Sanjay Kakar tried to look at this with various uh, uh, techniques and uh, and he uh, 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 and along with some of the other group and and found that these um, uh, seemed to correlate better with uh, uh, this risk of HCCs. It had some chromosomal abnormalities that suggested went beyond the standard ones you'd expect. You were seeing ones that showed up in HCC and that these were maybe a transitioning at least transitioning there and maybe shouldn't be called outright. Um, adenomas. And, and since then, they've been uh, even have better defined that there's different degrees of this beta catenin mutation that may also be associated with risk. And you'll find this in the WHO 19, uh, 2019 now that's just come out, where they've tried to separate those, where you have the large deletion in exon 3. That's the one that gives you the diffuse staining, that, and that's the lesion that's going to be highest risk for doing it. The, if you have this mutation, this 45, maybe you get some patchy GS staining. We call it the heterogeneous um, staining pattern. And I have one of these I'll show you in the case examples at the end of the talk. And then there's the uh, one with the lowest risk. And uh, they still have this patchy GS, but whether they actually are as risky for HCC uh, is is either variable or a little more unclear and not as, so this is probably the most benign of the group, but that's the thinking, at least now, so. So, but regardless, uh, the concept here is that maybe we shouldn't be classifying any beta catenin mutated lesion as an adenoma, but rather leave it as an atypical pedicellular lesion or something along that line, just so they don't get lost to follow up on, or maybe they want to uh, watch to resect that lesion if they see any sign of change. Then, and then we get to the uh, inflammatory type of adenoma, or IHCA, now, this was the one that originally was described, again, we're looking back to when I was, you know, young, uh, as um, uh, that FNH could have a telangiectatic variant, and this variant could be multifocal. And this was kind of this big paper on FNH and the variants of FNH, and that has now turned out to be, of course, this actually is inflammatory type of adenoma. And uh, it's, uh, here's some of their typical feature. Again, ill-defined borders, not encapsulated. Uh, dilated sinusoids gives that concept of the telangiectasia. You see these little fibrotic zones that contain arteries, typical multiple arteries, small arteries, with some inflammation associated with that. But that's not where the name comes from. The name comes from the production of the uh, serum amyloid A and the C-reactive protein. Arteries can occur in these small clusters. That can be a key in the diagnosis, too. And the ductular reaction that's common in this area right around these arter arteries, where it's not really true ducts, but probably kind of a metaplastic phenomenon at that quarter. So here we are with the uh, gross of some of these. This has uh, been fixed just enough to get the rim. I pulled it out quick enough. You know, the rim there has been fixed. But, you know, so we, uh, and you can see the lesions just kind of occur as a little blush. Sometimes just darker, 
slightly darker red, and if you and you can see this one had multiple lesions, so it can be very hard for the surgeon to identify these. In fact, I'm going to pinpoint a few others that you know with a closer look. You can these turned out to be the smaller microadenomas. So they're, they are, can be um, difficult to identify grossly for someone who's trying to resect the lesion or even when you're trying to take your samples. But of course we're noted, notably, notable uh, histology are these dilated sinusoids. These are particularly dilated here, but they can be a little more or less subtle. You notice these little dark spots are the arterial zones with the little inflammatory infiltrate increase. Here's one a little higher magnification, doesn't really have the lymphocytes, but you can see one larger art artery and multiple small arterioles. You may or may not have this larger artery there and a couple little ductular-like structures seeming to like come off the area where the liver cells are. It's like they're transitioning to that uh, phenotype. Here's another example it's just showing a little more uh, re inflammatory reaction associated with the ductular reaction, the small arteries, the dilated sinusoids. It's a little busier than the example that we had before. In fact, some of the ductular reaction became quite prominent uh, around the edges, and they can also develop that collate stasis appearance, the foamy look, because they become uh, um, bile stat uh, collate static rather than bile static, so much more. And then if you do your uh, inflammatory markers, the serum amyloid A and the C-reactive protein will be positive. The serum amyloid A and C-reactive protein typically would be fairly diffuse, probably uh, more than 80 percent, but the SAA, there's probably about uh, 5 to 10 percent of cases that will stain very minimally or not at all. So your CRP, on the other hand, should be positive probably to a great majority of the lesion. Otherwise, it's really not going to be defined as inflammatory adenoma. But unfortunately, it's not as specific either because even people with fatty liver disease get a lot of increased CRP in the background liver, and you uh, may have some, the, like, uh, Focal nodular hyperplasia in some cases can be quite uh, CRP positive in a patient with fatty disease, fatty liver disease. So, again, this is the one with the close association with obesity, but can, and so it also can be seen in men. So here's another one when I was growing up or I was younger, it was like, well, if you see an adenoma in a man, think again before you diagnose that, because it's probably not. But that's because you can throw that out the window now, too. And the age is, of course, typically 40 to 50 years old, because it takes you about 20 years of your diabetes or metabolic syndrome to probably develop these lesions. And uh, as the lesions get bigger, they are more likely probably hemorrhage. And this five centimeter mark that the, uh, the liver groups have put out there is almost more of just kind of grasping it out of the air as it seems to be, you know, that's where it started from Charles Balabo from Bordeaux. So, well, well, it's probably about five centimeters and that's gotten published and so that's, that's what we have. And, but he's probably about right. And that adenomatosis, of course, may be common. And in fact, I think this lesion that leads to this is almost like, a, is there's a field effect on the whole liver. And so I think uh, you can see this abnormality and like uh, adjacent to inflammatory adenoma, for example, you can see little portal tracts with too many arteries. And if you do your CRP stain, maybe slight increased staining around those zones. So um, again, the background liver, though, will have fat and, uh, and, and our, the SAA CRP should be positive. And the patients also, though, have an increased risk for HCC in about 10% of these who have very typical inflammatory adenomas stained the same way and will have a beta catenin mutation. And so those are ones that, uh, uh, so we still would do a look for the GS on these, these uh, uh, lesions as well. So, uh, but we also note there's an increased sense of HCC in patients with fatty liver that don't have cirrhosis and don't have adenomas. So there's more going on there in the fatty liver than just the adenomas to cause this uh, incidence. <laughs>
And then finally, we have the unclassified type of adenoma. This is really the leftovers. Uh, they had account for about less than 10% after you slip up all the other variants. And, uh, but they have had one minor variant now that this uh, um, Biloxage group has, has, has uh, honed in on. And this is the new sonic hedgehog. Uh, variety where they're the surrogate marker they're using to help identify this with the, um, you know, with immunohistochemistry is the arginosuccinate synthase, which can affectionately be called S1 or ASS1, you know. So, you know, I, I, so I guess we have to do ASS so you don't get sensor. But the, uh, but this, uh, it's interesting if this, this marker can occur in some of the other types of adenomas, but in the setting of these unclassified type, in other words, the sonic hedgehog type, it seems to have increased hemorrhagic risk. So, uh, uh, and that is sort of the uh, point about that uh, too. And they are in fact the cases uh, that uh, I've seen uh, that she's described and, uh, and, and, uh, and in, I've sent her to Mark on a couple of cases of ours. It would, did seem to have more of these telangiectatic vascular spaces. So there may be something to that. Maybe we should be looking at VEGF there uh, in those cases too uh, for a genre study. But the, uh, so again, we don't really know how big the problem though of these liver fatty acid, uh, fatty liver associated adenomas will be in my opinion because the obesity epidemic is growing and, and these are benign lesions that over a period of time may become more, we may see that they have a higher risk of cancer than we think. And if people are getting them in the non cirrhotic liver, this may change the way we look at lesions in the non cirrhotic liver as well, or what their etiologies would be. And in some ways, we don't know the exact phys pathophysiology of these new lesions because we haven't followed them long enough in a way to maybe know, like we are resecting some, well, with what would have happened to that lesion if we hadn't resected it. So we need to probably see as they're describing these new variants where what does happen to them and if there is any way to reverse their uh, growth patterns or other things. And finally, of course, from the pathologist's point of view, because we're the ones with the slide on our microscope, uh, I think it is important to try to uh, type the variants uh, because of the, the, the increase, especially the beta catenin and uh, inflammatory types because of the risk of HCC, the multifocality problem. Uh, follow them the size-wise for the risk of significant hemorrhagic um, issues that could develop. And we have to, of course, differentiate them from lesions that are going to have different types of follow-up, like focal nodular hyperplasia, um, which can uh, have some overlapping features, uh, differentiate these from, of course, well-differentiated or more obvious patocellular carcinoma. And then realize that there are variants of variants and variants. Because as you say, you know, I've shown you these stains, but uh, you know, if you start looking at a lot of these stains, there's, there can be issues even trying to interpret these stains. And you have to uh, kind of keep that in mind. That's the way pathology and histology goes. You know, so I'm going to show you a couple examples of what uh, of we've uh, looked at in the past uh, 15 or 20 years as uh, some variants. And this one, uh, case, as you could see in this slide, a young woman, 31, you're not really particularly thinking HCC so much, but a lot of ductular reaction. Here's some liver, here's hepatocytes. It was a, nodular, a nodule uh, with extensive ductular reaction and a lot of fibrosis. So the question, uh, Posed, and I sent this to my liver group as an example case of a variant of a variant. And we posed the question, is this FNH or is this inflammatory adenoma with ductular reaction? So we have done, I, I did the glutamine synthetase, which um, if you've ever done the glutamine synthetase on FNH, which I don't have time to show you, it should show a, a, a dark and light. You know, either you got it dense or nice dark staining and it alternates with hardly no staining and you'll see this patchwork that uh, it's been called map like pattern or you know uh, it's either there or faintly staining or it's it's not uh, and it's uh, and the uh, 
And then this duct, the ductules are here are what's staining here. All those ductules are staining, so keep that in mind. And, but when you do the C-reactive protein, the, everything uh, reacts. Now this was in a background of non-fatty liver, fortunately, in this patient. So the panel, uh, um, uh, the, and the SAA was negative, uh, and so in about 80% of the lesion. So the beta catenin was also negative. So everyone decided this was probably better classified as an inflammatory adenoma, uh, but uh, it was as, and uh, the, rather than FNH, because it wasn't typical at all for the FNH, um, FNH uh, pattern uh, of glutamine synthesis staining. It was out, so, you know, who knows, really. <laughs> but uh, that is the more prominent ductural reaction I'd ever seen in focal nodular hyperplasia, and it lacked some of that, the vascular malformation aspects of FNH as well. But a very unusual ductular prominence in that case. Here's another one. It was a case from Bordeaux, and this is the example of the glutamine synthetase staining that has been called now uh, heterogeneous. So instead of a nice diffuse solid staining, it's probably 50% or more of the cells are staining. And uh, the follow-up on it was that there was a, a beta catenin a mutation variant. I think it was the uh, S45 in this particular case, and, uh, and, the, and there has been shown now that you can see this type of spectrum of staining of the GS in that uh, some of these variants, but you can't exclude that this is the real, there are some that have this heterogeneous staining that have the, the, the high risk uh, type of exon 3, so again, this pattern would mean this is at least an atypical lesion if you don't do the uh, do, don't do the molecular marker. In fact, the panel there did think it was uh, uh, possibly still HCC HCA, excuse me, hepatic hepatocellular adenoma by morphology. But this one was a high risk lesion, and I think now as we understand uh, in the, even in the last couple of years how to name this rather than saying it was uh, beta catenin positive adenoma, we would classify this as an atypical hepatocellular uh, hepatic neoplasm uh, because of the uh, uh, increased risk for HCC and how we're not sure where that stands. So we do have these well-differentiated hepatocellular lesions. I think problems still remain in classification and diagnosis. And of course, there's always the big problem, how do you actually separate? When do you call an adenoma a carcinoma? You know, it helps if you've got that diffuse beta catenin staining, say, well, take it out no matter what. Or, uh, but you do, uh, but you know, how much reticulin loss is enough reticulin loss? Are there other features you can look for? Because you do get some uh, degree, some, you can have some degree of nuclear, isolated nuclear atypia with uh, adenomas over time that, you know, uh, as well. So you have to be a little careful with that as well. So it's still, I think, uh, I always say, well, you be careful. You have to be a little careful with the interpretation, especially on small biopsies, kind of keep in mind what some of the artifacts or variation with staining patterns, you know, how long a biopsy is fixed may vary how your glutamine synthetase staining is. Is it got that lighter background, darker background, where the biopsy kind of looks all positive but not staining dark or something like that. And some I think that probably has to do with fixation or uh, maybe even techniques on, on how the, the differences that you may have between a smaller biopsy and a larger sample. And then, of course, there are overlapping histologic features, as you know, with FNH. FNH can have wider plates, like HCC, can have big, um, have kind of rounded packets, like the adenomas or HCCs as well. The hepatocellular uh, carcinomas, obviously, can be quite differentiated and actually can have reticulin, and it could be quite abnormal. So I think molecular things, uh, molecular identification, I think is going to become more and more important uh, about how to, when do we set the, where do we want, it, can we draw a line of uh, when is a, a tumor really uh, a higher risk 
for developing a lesion as a potential to harm the patient or be more aggressive. And I think that's why studies like uh, Genus is going to be, could be, turn out to be very helpful. Looking for those chaotic, I like that, the chaotic uh, uh, changes. And uh, so I think the criteria for diagnosis of these well-differentiated HCCs may evolve as we learn more about the differences between these more adenoma-like lesions and these uh, uh, chaotic uh, genomes. So it gives me a new... Uh, uh, aspect to follow. So I think follow-up is important in these uh, patients. Resection could be necessary in some of these atypical hepatocellular neoplasms. At least close clinical follow-up. Don't let them walk away. Molecular testing can prove to be helpful. And so in conclusion, I would just say, well, you know, uh, fatty liver is more common than ever, and uh, uh, paticellular adenomas aren't rare anymore. And take home lesson for everyone, especially the trainees who may be in the audience, that uh, you can have unexpected complications of these new and evolving healthcare issues, or, or like even a drug therapies, et cetera, that can change your pathology. And you have to stay on top of that. And I always say, keep your eyes open for the unexpected. And I also advise people, you know, look at more in something the first diagnosis. Yes, there's the tumor there, but just give a little, a little look over there what's happening in that uh, liver next door. Make sure you don't miss the adenomatosis or the fatty liver or the, who knows, the next big thing, you know, and uh, uh, that's a mass effect even, so you know when you're not in the mass. And so uh, I think it's a, uh, that's the way I was taught, and I think it paid off in the end, and I ended up seeing arteries and funny places, and uh, there you go, off you go. So uh, uh, anyway, again, I want to uh, thank everyone so much for inviting me. It's made me very happy to be here, and um, it's, been, it's a great honor, and I always love coming to see and uh, meeting uh, new people, seeing friends and pathology here as well, and it's, uh, it's just a pleasure to be here and share this uh, with you. Thank you. Any questions, I guess? You have a little time, huh? Yes. Actually, the old gastric bypass, that, the current ones, the stapling, are quite risky. But when they originally did that jejunal ileal bypass, actually, yes, that was definitely a fibrosing. It almost gave more of a variant, too. Uh, but I remember that. Now, fortunately, they don't do those anymore. But there is, like, the, a couple of, at least, I think a couple of those patients had had a stapling. And in addition, they would went on, or a banding, and, and someone also had put themselves on an Atkins diet and lost the weight, like 100 pounds or 50 pounds in just a really short time, and it triggered it. In, triggered the entity. Not that everybody would happen, but there were, there's a high incidence, kind of a little more on the Hispanic uh, ethnicity. And even like uh, after resection of a large tumor in the liver, uh, it's a possibility that, uh, say, if you have fatty liver disease and you've just had your right lobe major resection, you could be at risk for liver failure due to this fatty, rapid progression of liver. Or say you're on tamoxifen or some other thing that enhances the steato, could enhance the steatohepatitis. Those may be incidences where you might have to think about that. It's thought maybe that they're just, the malnutrition also is known to cause fatty liver, and that may throw the liver, give just that little extra push that it, it, to make it more like, quote, alcohol, you know, and it gives it really a much more alcohol-looking pattern of injury with more cholestasis and, and uh, a fibrosing, a rapid fibrosing process. But it's pretty rare. But. All right, and thank you very much. <laughs>